Good morning. Good morning. If you would take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to be continuing the series of lessons, one which I think Paul brings uh, to view for us in chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, as Paul gives the purpose statement behind his writing. He says in 1 Timothy 3, verses 14 and 15, he says, I hope to come to you soon. But I'm writing these things so that you, or so that, if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and ground of the truth. Paul wrote the letter which we're studying as a means of providing sound instruction for the church, so that Timothy would have something to take to the brethren and establish rules and establish uh, boundaries. And there are certain boundaries that have been placed and certain rules that have been placed and certain responsibilities that have been set upon people. In chapter one, we saw that. In chapter one, we looked at the relationship between the church and her doctrine and how it was that Timothy was to stay and to protect the church from sound doctrine, not to allow anyone to come and and teach what was false, but instead to stand for the truth. All of this comes down to the, the whole point of the letter being in order that the church, both in Ephesus and the church today, that the church would be pure, protected, and productive. That's what First Timothy is all about, keeping the church pure, protected, and productive. And... We're going to continue with that thought here in chapter 2 as we look at the relationship between the church and her worship. In verses 1 through 7, we're going to look this morning and we're going to look at uh, two specific acts of worship that are brought out here. You have in verses 1 through 3, you have prayer. And then in verses 4 through 7, you can make the application to preaching. And then tonight we're going to come back and look at verses 8 through 15. We're going to talk about participation. How it is that each person in the church is to engage in these acts and also find their place within the church. So we talk about the church and worship. There's a lot of questions that uh, could be asked. And one of the questions is, what does proper worship look like? If I'm going to worship accordingly... Uh, with sound doctrine, how do I do that? And not only necessarily what does that look like, but what does it not look like? And some of those questions, I believe, will find their answer here as we uh, study this text together. If you would, we're going to read verses 1 through 7, and then we're going to come back and we're going to um, make some notes about verses 1 through 7. Beginning there in verse 1. It says, first of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high places, <clears throat> that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. That's verses 1 through 7. As I noted earlier, in verses 1 through 7, we see two acts being brought out. We see prayer being brought out, and we see preaching being brought out. Preaching is not as blatantly brought out as prayer is. Prayer seems to fall within the categories or within the boundaries of verses 1 through 3. And as you look at prayer, we can make a note that prayer, what it is, at least as given in the context here, it is a means by which we can tell God about men. And as we look at verses 1 through 3, there's a couple different things we can note. We can note first the different types of prayers that we see there in verse 1. You have supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings. As you look at that word supplications, in the Greek it's the word decease, and it's related to begging. It is you begging 
um, making your personal wants known. It is a time where uh, you, you come and you, you share these different requests that have been born of deep consideration and reflection. It's not something like, I want a new bicycle or I want a new boat. It's not dealing with superficial desires, but it's dealing with spiritual desires. And namely, in the context, I believe verse 4 serves as the hub here that God desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And so our desires should respond or should reflect God's desires. And so here I am, I'm offering supplications, I'm begging God with the tone of lost men coming to a knowledge of the truth. So I think in these different supplications, something I, I might request to God is knowledge or help uh, toward being a better aid to the church. Knowledge or help toward having a greater devotion to God, greater devotion to his word a greater devotion to my family and others who might be lost. These are supplications, requests that are made with the flavor of lost men being saved. You have prayers, which is the Greek word um, uh, prosuke, which is just a very general word for prayer. And this very general word for prayer seems to carry with it the idea of entering into a conversation with God without any a specific agenda um, not to ask of something not to give thanks for something but basically just to have an honest open communication with God and this honest open communication with God if we're going to keep it within the context and have it reflect that of verse 4 in our own lives then we might talk to God about uh, the compassion that we have for others those whom we're trying to study with, those whom we're trying to reach with the gospel. We might uh, express confusion about people, why it is that uh, they have been rejecting the gospel, uh, why it is that they've been delaying in receiving the gospel, obeying the gospel. We might talk to him about different circumstances, confusion about those circumstances. Why is it that, you know, um, I'm trying to study with this person, I'm trying to teach them the truth, and this circumstance came into their life that has seemingly derailed that. We might talk to God about those things. We, we pray about those things. We communicate with him about those things. You have intercessions here, and that's the Greek word entukis, which is very similar to a supplication except this is a request that you're offering on the behalf of someone else. Um, supplication or in intercession here is, is, as you follow the, the origin of the word, it is believed that this word originally dealt with um, describing intimate conversations between two people. Um, on behalf of another. But as time progressed, this word would be used to describe the idea of someone coming to a king and making a request to the king on behalf of his people. And I think as we look at the intercessions here, uh, one thing that uh, we might be interceding on behalf of others for is Tommy. Time for the gospel to reach them. We might be interceding, uh, praying on behalf of others for a, a variety of things. I think you could include policies, you can include uh, a variety of entities, you could include all sorts of relationships, relationships between uh, subordinates and their authority, or authority and their subordinates. And, Basically, you're praying with this with this idea of making a, a request so that perhaps them coming to a knowledge of the truth, being saved, just becomes a little bit easier. Or, as you see there, 
in verse 2 and 3, specifically verse 2, so that you doing that, you going and teaching and, and living the Christian life, that becomes a little easier. You, you pray, you, sup, you offer your supplications, you offer your intercessions with these goals in mind. Uh, but ultimately, again, the goal that lost men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Then you give them your thanksgivings. And um, the Greek word here is Eucharista. And it, it's, of course, the expression of gratitude. You're giving your thanks to God. And so this might be thankfulness for answered prayers. As you've sought to study with someone, this might be thankfulness for unanswered prayers. Uh, this might be thankfulness as you have seen that God has opened doors of opportunity for you to share the gospel. And this might be thankfulness as you perhaps have seen the hand of God in your life and in the life of those that you're trying to uh, study the gospel with and, and share salvation with. Um, seeing the hand of God, seeing basically your prayers progressively begin to become answered. Those are different types of prayers that you see here. You see different topics of prayers. Uh, continuing in verse 1 and going into verse 2, you have prayers for people just in general. He says, for all people. Paul expects, God expects that these prayers, intercessions, supplications, thanksgivings be made for all people, just people in general. And that's important because as you see the, uh, as you see the progression of prayer, as it, as it was a teaching left to man and people began to come in and, and provide different traditions and different ideas into prayer. You see that prayer, at least in the time of Christ, got far away from the intention uh, of, of which it was originally provided. The intention for which it was originally provided was to communicate to God about other men, about yourself, but not to glorify yourself. But it got to a point in which the Jews, specifically, we see this in Luke chapter 18 and verses 9 through 14, the Jews had come into a pattern in which they would pray selfishly, they would pray nationalistically. Um, you have the, the, the Pharisee there, his prayer clearly is self centered and it's, it's self empowering. And all of that's by malpractice, all of that is against God's original intention. In Luke nine or Luke eighteen verses nine through fourteen, that the Pharisee offers a prayer in the company of a tax collector, and, and it's uh, shameful. The words that he says, he says, "God, I thank you that I'm not like other men." And he continues on, and he says, "Like this tax collector, he got pretty selfish, he got pretty." Uh, self-empowering and that's not how prayer was intended prayer was intended to be offered by Christians uh, or prayer as offered by Christians was intended to be entirely different it was not intended to be selfish but it's intended to be selfless we see in Ephesians 6 verses 18 and 19 Paul talks about using our prayers for the supplications of others uh, in, in order that they might meet the end goal for every Christian, which is perseverance. Uh, you have um, in Matthew 5 and verse 44, a very different command concerning prayer. Prayer, again, was very self-centered. And if I was going to pray for someone under a, under a previous non-Christian mindset, then I would pray for my friends. But Jesus tells us in Matthew 5 and verse 44, he says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's quite different. That's very inclusive of all people. Um, prayer, uh, we see in, in Colossians 4, verses 3 and 4, isn't just focused on people who are saved, but it's focused on people who are not saved. Again, Paul would say there in Colossians 4, verses 3 and 4, he would ask them, basically, Pray that the Lord open doors for me to teach the gospel and to make it plain. That was Paul's desire. That's a Christian's desire. Notice that. It's focused on salvation. We pray for people in general and we pray for people in government, for kings and people 
all people who are in high offices, high positions. And I think this command comes because there would be a natural temptation that is born that as we strive to pray for all people, we would like we would likely begin to refuse certain people. And I think for some people, it becomes a little bit easier to pray for those who persecute them, but not so much the people who make the policies that make it lawful and direct people to persecute them. There might have been a hindrance, at least in the mind of the Christians there in the first century. The first century, they were living through very real persecution. And they were getting to a point whenever Paul writes to Timothy in which they were going to face the greatest persecution that the Christians had ever faced, which would be under the emperorship of Nero. And they would come again and they would face a great persecution whenever Domitian would come in AD 90. Uh, they were dealing with something that was much more serious and uh, much more costly than what we're dealing with today. Today, we might be apprehensive to pray for a certain president or a certain office member or cabinet member because of the policies that they are pushing which might limit against free speech or, or, or things of that nature. They were being encouraged to pray for the people who were putting out laws to have them tied to stakes and lit on fire. They were praying for people. They were commanded, 1 Peter 2 and verse 17, to love the emperor who would take them and place them in the Colosseum so that all of his Roman buddies could watch as they were eaten by wild lions and tigers and trotted underfoot by hippopotamuses and all sorts of just wild beasts. Very, very different for them than it is for us today. And I believe to an extent we have a greater apprehension to follow through with these commands here than they did. And if anybody had a reason for that temptation to withhold themselves from these commands, it'd be them. But they did it. They prayed for those who were in higher positions. What do you pray whenever you think about these people? You're praying for all people. You're praying for those who are government officials and people of high positions that make laws. What do you pray? You pray for their souls. You pray for, for their souls that you know the gospel might come to them. And you pray in order that their policies, you see it there, he says, who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, God may dignified in every way. We pray so that policies, some of their policies might fall closer to God, uh, His Word, and ultimately help to provide us a peaceful life. That's what you're seeing there in verses 2 and 3. You have your, you have your uh, targets of prayer to give your life ease, just make it easier to be a Christian. Awesome, please God. Verse 3, this is good. And it's pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. I did a devotional recently on a Wednesday night where I looked at that phrase, this is good and it is pleasing to the sight of God, our Savior. That's a phrase that's used only twice in the Bible. It's used here in 1 Timothy 2, verse 3, and then it's used again in 1 Timothy chapter 5, talking about taking care of the widows. And ultimately, what I think what is being shown there is God wants us to be mindful and actively tending to the spiritual needs of people as well as the physical needs of people. And here, you certainly see a spiritual need being brought up. Ultimately, a spiritual need falling into the hub of this chapter, verse 4, that God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You have prayers of all sorts that are mentioned here. You have supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings, all of these things are to be used for men for the sake of their salvation and also in, with uh, 
the Christians in mind and the Christian's life in mind as well as ultimately God's pleasure in mind. That's verses 1 through 3. You continue verses 4 through 7 and you see preaching, I believe, brought out here a little bit. In verse 4, you see, I remind you, it reads, Who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth? Verse 5, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. You think about preaching, there's three things that we can pick up here from verses 4 through 7. We can pick up two things concerning the message of preaching, and then we can pick up one thing concerning the messenger. Verses uh, 4 through 6 deal with the message. Verse 4 shows us that the message of preaching should include mercy. God desires all men to be saved. This statement right here, desires all men to be saved, is a statement which creates a great difficulty for the Calvinists. The Calvinists teach as one, is, one of their five primary tenets, the idea of limited atonement, which is the idea that before the foundation of the earth, whenever God had, had come up with the number of however many souls would inhabit earth, he, he desired that some would be saved and he desired that some would be condemned and they would be lost in that ever uh, standing stint, uh, uh, stance of being condemned. There would be no opportunity for them to have salvation. That's limited atonement. Only a certain amount of people could have salvation. But yet God desires all men to be saved. Limited atonement is a doctrine that comes out from an idea that man does not have free will. The opportunity to choose. But ever since the beginning, man has had opportunity to choose. They had an opportunity in the garden to choose which fruit they were going to eat and which fruit they were not going to eat. They were commanded not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but they did so with the consequence that in that day that they ate, they would surely die. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 8, Cain, yeah, Cain is given an option. He has become angered with Abel, his brother, because Abel's sacrifice was pleasing to God Cain's sacrifice wasn't. And so there Cain is. He is sulking in his anger. He is stewing. And God comes to him in verse 8 and he says, Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is to rule over you. And he could have left it there if there was no such thing as free will. But instead, God said, But you must rule over it. Cain rule over it. No. Was free will offered? Yes. Was free will there? Yes. And the, the God that we see in 1 Timothy chapter 2 is a merciful God who, having extended free will to mankind, he desires for men to be saved. All men to be saved. There's no reservation about the type of man to be saved. It doesn't matter their background. It doesn't matter the type of sins which they have committed. It matters whether or not they were willing to die to sin, to take up their cross, as Jesus says in Luke 9 and verse 23, and follow after him daily. That's what matters to him. He's a merciful God, and that mercy of his has been displayed time and time again, but it's beautifully illustrated in the giving of his son, John 3 and verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It has been so beautifully shown in his patience with mankind. There is a promise, a sure promise that this world will be destroyed. And when this world is destroyed, that is it. There is no further opportunity for salvation once this world is destroyed. There is no further opportunity for salvation for some once they go into the grave. Hebrews 9 verse 27 is appointed that once for man to die and then comes the judgment. No opportunity between death and judgment. 
No opportunity between the destruction of this world and judgment. But you know what 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 tells us? Following and right before reiterating that there is a destructive, or a destructive day to take place in this world's history in which all opportunity for salvation will slip away and never resurface. Right in the middle of that, he says, but God is not slack concerning his promises. He's not making promises that he can't fulfill, basically. He's not slack. He's not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Time. How is God's mercy beautifully illustrated through history, time, and his son? That's what we preach. We preach God's mercy. The very idea that despite the many sins and rebellion of man, he desires all to be saved. And he desires all to come to a knowledge of the truth. Without the truth, men cannot receive their salvation. And without the truth, men will wander from their salvation. They will abandon their salvation, as you have seen brought out there in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, talking about those Hymenaeus and Alexander who had made shipwreck their faith. They made shipwreck their faith because chapter 1 in verse 7 and verse 8, they have wandered away from these things, which was a sound faith, a good conscience, their love. They wandered away from love. They wandered away from the truth. Knowledge is essential in salvation. It's an interesting order that you see Paul bringing this out in verse 4. He says he desires that all men be saved and then come to a knowledge of the truth. I think a lot of times we, we think about coming to a knowledge of the truth and then being saved. But this is the same sort of order that you see Jesus laying out in Matthew 28 in verses 18 to 20 as he charged his disciples to go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them. There's an order. And this order isn't just necessarily saying, well, you don't need to know anything before you get into the water. You just need to trust us to get in the water. That's not what it's saying. But it's saying this. Whenever you go into the waters of baptism, notice this. This coincides with God's desire here. God's desire. Men be saved, number one. Come to knowledge of the truth, number two. Whenever you go into the waters of baptism, you go in as a student. And you come out as a student. You constantly study the word, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 15, to show yourself approved. A worker who has no need to be ashamed. That means whenever you stand before God and he says, what have you done with your life? You have no reason to be ashamed if they answer. I've studied your work. I've made myself a disciple of yours. No need to be ashamed of rightly handling the word of truth. The word of God. When you go into the waters of baptism, you go in as a student. You come out as a student. You continue as a student. You live your days as a student of his. You can't come up out the waters and leave everything alone and expect to be all right. There is a constant continuance in the faith as uh, Peter would describe it. Peter would describe it in 2 Peter chapter 1. He would list about five different things, five or six different things that the disciples needed to supplement their faith with. Supplement, add to, continually add to. The idea of vitamins, you take your vitamins daily to be of good health. They were to supplement themselves with these things and if they did not, he says that they would become like those who were blind. And in verse 10 he says, make your calling and election sure. 
How do you do that? Adding those things. How do you do that? Studying his word. Continuing in his word. Continuing in his knowledge. So, as we look at preaching, and we're looking at verses 5 through 6 at the message of preaching, the very first thing is mercy. We preach God's mercy, his compassion, his love. one of the primary things about God is mercy, compassion, and love. Micah 7, verse 18 and 19. Who is a God like you? The very next, the very first characteristic brought out about God. Pardoning the iniquity. Pardoning the iniquity. He's mercy. You continue verse 5 and 6. And we preach the mediator. We preach God's mercy. We preach God's mediator. Verse 5, there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. There is one God, and that God desires all men to be saved, which means by proxy that all men are lost. All men are lost, not because of Adam's sin, but because of their own sin. Ezekiel 18 and verse 20, the sin uh, the soul that sins shall surely die. Romans 3 and verse 23, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's one God, and he is holy, and he is stainless. And then there's man. Man is not holy. Man is stained. But then there's the mediator, Jesus Christ, the reconciler, the, the gulf between, the man who provides the access. And he is the only one. There is no other channel to that holy, stainless, sinless God than Jesus Christ. And that is because of Jesus Christ's holy, stainless, sinless life. He who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. 1 Peter chapter 2, he knew no deceit. And guess what? He was still the one on the tree. And for what purpose? To cleanse us from our sins. Ephesians 1 and verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The mediator, Jesus Christ. And it can only be Jesus Christ. It's not Mary. It is certainly no man who holds himself up to the status of speaking for God. You think about the Pope. You think about those who served in different uh, parishes as the Father, it's none of them. It's not the saints. It's not the apostles. It's not the angels. It's Jesus Christ. It's the one who gave himself for our sins. Mark 10, verse 45, Jesus said, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's why he came, and that's what we preach. We preach God's mercy. We preach God's mediator. And as you look at the messenger there in verse 7, from Paul's perspective, he's talking about himself. He's saying this is the reason, God's mercy, God's mediator. This is the reason that I have been appointed to be a teacher, to be a preacher, to be an apostle. In part, Paul's saying, it's to teach them of the mercy of God. And then the other part is to teach them about the mediator between them and God, Jesus Christ. But ultimately, here's what it is. Ultimately, it is to be the answer to the prayers that we're all offering. Not that Paul is the absolute answer, but he is the means for an answer. 
We're praying that people be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. We're praying that change occur in our nation, in our world, so that the life of a Christian just eases a little bit. It's fine to pray about those things, but we talk about practicing what you preach. You have to practice what you pray. You, you pray for open doors, guess what that means? You go to every single door you see, and you turn the knob and see if it opens. That's praying and following through with that prayer for open doors. And that's what Paul is saying is, I am the follow through for these prayers. And the point is, Timothy, you're the follow through for these prayers. Timothy, the people that you're teaching, they're the follow through for these prayers. We here today, we are the follow through for those prayers. We are the hands and feet of the gospel. We take the gospel to those and we confront them with the gospel. We share with them God's mercy and God's mediator so that they might be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. We don't just simply pray that it happened and not do anything, but we practice what we pray. We serve as a means for the answer. And so preaching in verses 4 through 7, as, as I believe Paul makes it known, is preaching is a ministry of the church. It is a part of our worship, but it's also a part of our daily service to go and to make known to the laws God, His mercy, and His mediator. There in verses 1 through 7, you have two different acts of worship that are brought up. You have prayer, you have preaching. Those two acts of worship certainly have some differences, but they have a similarity. They have at least one commonality, and that is that they are done with the intention of bringing lost souls to God. This is truly God's desire that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And as stated earlier, there is no better evidence for that no better picture of that, no better illustration of that desire than God sending His Son and allowing us time. God has sent His Son so that we could have salvation. Jesus said, John 14, verse 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Jesus laid out a series of commands that were necessary for salvation. Belief, John 8 and verse 24. Repentance, Luke 13 and verse 3. Confession, Matthew 10 and verse 32. Baptism, Mark 16 and verse 16. And continual devotion to Him, Matthew 10 and verse 22. All of those are commands in order to help get us to salvation. If we do them, we will be saved. That's God's mercy. God's mercy has also been seen right in the amount of time we've been given a lot of us have been given a lot of time to, to digest the gospel to weigh it out to count the cost to consider it to evaluate it to accept it and who knows maybe there's more time maybe there's not but whenever Paul talked about the gospel to the Corinthian church he told them this he told them that there was, he, he first spoke about a prophecy. There was a prophecy in which there would be a time of refreshing. Paul, after speaking about that prophecy, tells them, explains to them basically the prophecy and says, today is the time of refreshing. Obey the gospel. If you need time to consider the gospel, I hope that you take it. I hope that you use it wisely. But I hope that you keep in consideration that Time is, as James describes in James chapter 4, time is but a mist. It appears for a little while, then it's gone. The days of our life, David describes them as a hand breath, which is the width of your palm. Think, think about the width of your palm in comparison with your whole body. That's nothing. That's absolutely nothing. So use your time wisely. If you have a need of salvation today, please let us know. We would love to uh, discuss that with you. We'd love to baptize you if you need to be baptized. If you need the prayers of the congregation, we'd love to pray with you and for you. If you need studies, we would love to have a study with you. Any of those things, 
that you need, you can come and make them known as together we stand as we sing. Mm -hmm.